like something good to eat, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, we we're working together, and he's like, uh, he said, "Hey man, I got a text from Dana." I asked him about who my next opponent was, and then he, and he showed me the text, and he said, "You," and I'm like, I'm like "Oh man, it's already on now." We already distinguished the idea. I mean, extinguish the idea that we even will fight just because of the fact that we had such good work in chemistry, you know, and I thought that maybe they wouldn't do that just because it'll bring a little bit of awkwardness, you know, but uh, we were both wrong. He says he's not going to rub it in if, you know, he should win. Um, what would your side of that be if you win? Would you rub it in at all, throw him a couple digs? I, I wouldn't rub it in, but uh, I wouldn't overtly rub it in, I guess to say. <laughs> I wouldn't be like, you know, I wouldn't make a big deal about it, but every once in a while I'll give him the look like, you know what happened, right? He said you'd, you'd yeah. have to, he'd have to get your coffee or something on the set. You'd, yeah. be, you'd be on coffee I'll, detail. I'd be on coffee detail. Like, I won't be able to say nothing about anything. He know? says that he doesn't even think he can take you down, that your wrestling is that good, that your takedown defense is that good, that he's trying to come up with plan B and C. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think Chell is just running game. What he's trying to do is he's trying to do the oldest trick in the book. He's trying to disarm me. You see that? Y'all see what's happening here? Y'all falling for it? I'm not falling for it. He's, so, so I'm supposed to thinking like, you know, going there with uber confident, but meanwhile, he's already got in his mind. Let's be honest here. Chael Sonnen has one way of fighting, and that's coming straight at you. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter what your game plan is. He has one game plan, and that's impose his will, which is, uh, you know, he, he does with, with everybody he fights. And um, I'm expecting him to do that on Saturday. He actually said that he's not going to come across the cage and run right at you. I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't believe it. But I'll tell you what, if he doesn't come right at me, then I'm going to come right at him. So he better. How about all these new coaches that you have down at the Black Zillions that have really kind of, it seems to even given you part of what your resurgence is and your last few fights here. What can you credit uh, to those coaches that have come down that are new to the Black Zillions facility? You know, I'll tell you, our coaches are amazing. Uh, Henry Hoof, Kenny Monday, George Santiago. Uh, those guys run, run a great, great camp. Pedro Diaz, great camp, you know. And, and one thing they do more than anything is that they, they're able to communicate to each fighter. You know, a lot of times when you get on a team, uh, the individual seems to be lost, and, and the individual part of the sport seems to be lost. But our sport is a two-part process, meaning the fact that uh, one is the individual, the big part is the individual, but a, a large part as well is, is the team aspect, and that is based upon the fact that I can't go out there and win a fight by myself. I need my training partners. I need the next guy in the room trying to knock my ass out because if he doesn't, the guy in the, in the cage is going to try to do that for me, to me. So. Um, it's a team aspect in that point, and our coaches have done a very good job of reaching out and nurturing our individual side, our individual weaknesses, and things that you know we need to get better on, the things that we're very good at, and trying to make the things that we're good at really good. You, uh, the, the Black Zillions, the first year you guys were around, took a lot of criticism, but lately <laughs> it's been a big win streak. We just saw Vitor do his thing, you know, obviously Eddie Alvarez. I mean, do you feel like you guys have turned the corner and everyone that was trying to judge you back then was just, you know, you had to sit back and just listen to it and wait because we knew the results would come? Yeah, uh, you know, you put together the team and it's, uh, you know, it's like in a sense a dream team. You know, and there's all these great expectations that were supposed to follow, but when we didn't live up to that right away and we had our, our rough moments trying to make sure everything gelled together, trying to make sure all the pieces fit, it, we took a lot of heat. But I think taking a lot of heat was probably the best thing for us as a team and us uh, individually speaking because we learned uh, what it really means. And that, I mean, um, when you are only used to hearing praise, only used to hearing good things, you're not able to, you're not able to uh, distinguish sometimes uh, how to build yourself in your mind, mentally speaking, you know, how, how, how much to buy into it. You know, so if you only uh, only used to hearing the good things, and you have a bit of a a bit of an inflated ego, you know. So once you hear both sides of it, you kind of understand it from where it, where it is. You kind of understand like, okay, there's going to be good things said about me, and there's going to be bad things said about me. But at the same time, I'm not going to let either one of these things define who I am, you know. And that's what we need to do: not let one thing, whether it be good or bad, define who we are as a team. Because the truth of the matter is, we may hit another rough spell. But because we hit a rough spell before, we know how to make it through. And that's through hard work and perseverance. Did you, how much did your uh, leadership help? Because you guys went through that at Jackson's. I remember that there was a yeah. streak where I think it was your tie with Tito. And, you know, there was just a streak there for work of God where you guys were going through some losses. Did you 
you know, kind of implement any leadership in those moments when it was getting to be a kind of a rough time? I, you know, I, I did. You know, I tried to do the best I can, but, you know, I was going through a rough time as well, you know, and I guess the thing about it was is the fact that, um, you know, actually a lot of the younger guys helped out because they kept bringing this, you know, their, their uh, naiveness to the whole game brought a sense of freshness because they didn't really get a full spectrum of the idea of what was going on. So for them, they, they kind of brought this energy to the gym every single day. And I was able to feed off of that energy, that brand newness, that that excitement to want to go out there and be the best again. And, and that's what it was. You know, Henry Hoof had a very uh, good conversation with us. And, and he told us, you know, he says, listen, let's just stop looking for the secret to fighting. Let's stop looking for a, a, a new way to do this. We all know how to do this. We're fighters. This is what we do. You know, let's stop trying to um, make too too much of this what it is. What we do is we come in here and we fight every single day. But we got to make sure we come inside this room and fight every single day. We got to make sure you come in here to to push your, your 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 teammate. So let's stop trying. Let's get away from all these private sessions here, private sessions there. Because when you do that, you know, a lot of guys will go do the private sessions and not really show up for the class part. But it's really big on pushing the class part because in the classroom and, and with the that's where we got better because we were pushing each other. Rashad, this is, um, you're fighting on the 20th anniversary card here. There's been kind of a lot of nostalgia talk. I'm just curious, do you remember what was the first first time you heard of UFC or what was the first fight you saw? The first time I he heard of UFC, I think it was in a Black Belt magazine. I was uh, doing karate at a Tang Sudo place in, in uh, Niagara Falls. And um, me and my friend talked about what would happen if a boxer go against you know, a karate guy, you know, if Bruce Lee went against Mike Tyson for the longest time and that we heard about this is going to be happening so we ended up watching the first UFC you know we we're babysitting some kids and we ended up watching the first UFC the kids were put to bed yeah the kids, <laughs> the kids were already sleeping and we had like one of those old cheater boxes remember those old cheater boxes yeah. we had one of those those joints and we were watching it and we were just amazed man because it, it answered all our questions and it was just so amazing to see like you know martial arts on a stage that it was on, a real life stage, not just some, you know, uh, idea of what it could be like, you know, in a kata, if this happened, he can do this and do this. It was real life, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we've seen a lot of techniques that we thought would be finishing moves, not be finishing moves, like someone strike the knee, with the, you know, we used to think that would be like an immobilizing move, the knee a break in half, like some Steven Seagal movie, but that wasn't the case, you know what I'm saying? So it, it shelled a lot of our ideas, but it opened up a lot of them too, you know? And I remember walking away that night uh, from the fight, just being like, man, I want to, um, I want to, uh, to be a fighter. I remember telling my instructor that I want to be a fighter. You know, and, and it was just something crazy because now here I am, 20 years later, I'm a fighter and I'm fighting in the 20th anniversary. What were, what were those next few steps after you said in your head, I want to be a fighter? Where did it go from there? Um, I, I continued in my karate career and at the time I, I really got into wrestling, but football was calling me so I, I, I balanced out. Um, I stopped doing karate and then I started doing more of just playing football and wrestling, you know. But it was always something that I um, was a big fan of, you know. And then when the UFC went into the dark ages, when it was really not uh, on TV anymore, I was always, you know, trying to find a way to get those VHS tapes or find a way to watch those fights, man. You know, I... Can, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me just interrupt for 30 seconds here. Dave's got a quick announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we have one quick final so announcement like to make you for you today. Look a little quicker today than I have. You have to go back to the room and reassess that. <laughs> Johnny Hendricks, along with UFC legend and former heavyweight champion of the world, another legend joining us today, Mark the Hammer Coleman. Johnny and Mark, come on out. Mark's not coming. But I am. Uh, um, Mark's not coming. Who made the biggest impact out of those? We've seen Mark today, we've seen Hoist today. Who made the biggest, who was your favorite fighter from those early days? Mine was Hoist and it was reluctantly so because like he wasn't the most exciting as far as like the punching and stuff that I like to see, but he was my favorite in the fact that he was the, the guy who really showed that size doesn't mean anything, you know? And that was important for me because I was a runt, you know? I was like, I, like in a junior in high school, I was 145 pounds. You know, and I was like a little runt, and I was always the smallest guy in the crew because I ran with a bunch of guys that were like at least two years older than me. And when you're 145 pounds and you're slow to puberty and everybody else is already, you know, already peaked, you know, you look like a midget. So for, for me to be around those, you know, for me to see 
poised grace to go out there and do it and size didn't really matter. It was a big confidence booster for me. Did it blow your mind as much as it did everybody else it, watching? What is this did. thing that he's doing? It did. It blew my mind. I didn't know what the heck he was doing. It was like some magic trick, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was crazy how he would just find a way to get those submissions and find a way to outwork a guy even when it seemed like he was on you know, he he was gonna lose, you know. And back in the day, like it was thought you're on your back, the fight's over, you're gonna lose. You know, the guy on the bottom always loses. So he changed his whole mindset. Friendship uh, wise, is it tougher to face Chael or uh, John Jones at, at the time? Um, you know, it, it was it, it was more tougher to face uh, John Jones just because it was just so much so much into it going into that fight. You know, it was just the history and everything that 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 was uh, at stake there. You know, it was I had a very very close. Um, connection with everybody at Jackson's gym you know those guys are family to me for a long time before he came into the picture so it was kind of a, a sense of me losing a piece of my family and I hurt and I stung more than anything than, than the fight itself. Do you want another shot at him and do you think that this fight can project you to that? I definitely want another fight a chance to fight uh, John again and uh, anything I can do to, to work my way back up I'll work my way back up and However long it takes, that's how I'm going to do it. You know, I have full confidence in my skills. I have full confidence in, in, in the fact that I can get there again. Has the, sting, kind of, has the sting of that move kind of wore off now where you kind of like, okay, I'm in that other part of my career. You feel like, a, you know, you feel like yourself again, I guess. I do feel like myself again, and, and the sting has wore off. You know, it was just, you know, a, a big part of, of moving on in life is just, is just forgiveness. You know, and, that's, and that was what was hurting me for the longest time. I was holding on to so much resentment that it was actually hurting me more than anything, you know. But once I once I was able to just, you know, just forgive and move on, my life got better. Everything started to get better. Things started to move forward. And no longer did I have those feelings of, you know, betrayal that I had before. It was just I had a different understanding of the, of the whole situation. And it was just the fact that, you know, sometimes in life people just have to go in their different directions. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's hard to do, but at the same time, nevertheless, we all have to go in our own directions at some point. Was there a certain moment where that kind of clicked? Where uh, it was like you know, one it, thought? I can't really say what was the exact moment, but I remember, uh, you know, just, just sitting there one day and it just kind of like occurred to me like, you know what, like what, like what, what was it all about? You know, I see, I think it was like, I seen Greg somewhere and I like, um, I started to not speak. I started to put my head down and not speak and, and keep walking like I did before. But then I was like disappointed at man. I used to have, I used to share some great times with him, great memories with him. And, you know, he, he was somebody I considered a good friend. You know, and the same thing with Mike Winklejohn. You know, I, I, had, I tried to, you know, I had a, a grudge with him for the longest time. But I, um, you, know, I you, know, you know what it was actually? It was right before the fight with Noguera. That's exactly what it was in the locker room. We were in the locker room. And I had that kind of like that piece. You know, maybe that's why I fought so docile. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about your, Too much uh, your airport yeah. meeting with. Uh, tell us about your airport meeting with Rampage. Ah, I seen Rampage. Yeah, yesterday. Um, yeah, he he was going to his Bellator fight, and we chopped it up a little bit. And you know, he he was like, you know, man, yeah, let's take a picture, man. I'm, I'm tired of everybody saying I look like you, man. Everybody, everybody saying I'm you, man. Shit. He didn't look happy in the picture. He didn't look happy at all. He was smiling before that. You know that's Rampage. Rampage, <laughs> Rampage always he's always got to look disgusted. That's his image. <laughs> he can't be caught smiling. Who saw him first? I mean, I see actually Tyrone seen him and then uh, then I went up to him and said what's up to him, you know. He was about to board on his plane. Speaking of Tyrone, when's he gonna make his way? You know, I don't know. You know, he he's been uh he's been working on it, working his way up there, you know, as far as uh you know, doing doing kickboxing, and now he's going to venture into doing boxing now. So he's going to be doing all three sports, uh, you know, pretty soon. But he's just taking his time with it more than anything. He's not really rushing everything, especially with MMA. There's so many facets to the sports, and him being, uh, you know, a striker at heart and, and, and basis, he really has to, you know, make sure he, he uh, is all well, you know, well well rounded before he's got a he just. Pretty good wrestling coach, though, right? He does. <laughs> yeah, I heard he's all right. He's all right. <laughs> what's, the, what's the harder fight, Rashad? Is it the one where there's so much animosity and dislike, like with John or maybe Rampage, or this one where you and Shale are legitimately friends and co? Like he was telling us yeah. two weeks later, you guys are gonna be on the same set again together. So yeah, yeah it's uh, you know, it's, 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 it remains to be seen because I've never been in a situation where I actually had to fight somebody that that I'm like, you know, this this cool, but you know, and there's no, there's there's just, there's not that feeling. Like when I see him, I don't get that feeling. Like, oh man, I'm gonna punch him in his face. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so it, it, it's it's more of like a um, like a competition more than anything, you know, like just competitively speaking, you know, it doesn't have that like fight feeling. Um, hopefully, when it comes time to the fight, and I'm pretty sure I will be able to hit the switch and just make it a fight.
Rashad, as a Fox analyst, uh, how do you see the main event? Who do you think will win and uh, why? Uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to say, you know what I'm saying? But I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a George St. Pierre fan. You know, George George is my guy all the way. And, um, you know, we train together. We share some time together. So I can never go against my boy. Rashad, when you fought Dan in your last fight, a lot of the build up to that was, you know, what was wrong with you when you fought Nogueira? You know, can he come back and look like the old Rashad? And, you, you won the fight when you, when you watched it. Were you 100 percent happy with it? Did you feel like you were the older shot? Or um, you know, there, there, there was a you know I was happy with the performance, meaning the fact that uh, I, I worked through it. And there were some tough times in the fight where I had to really dig down deep and and, and and go for it. And that reminded me of my old self, and that's what I had to do to even get to the position where I am right now. So uh, it did remind me of myself, but I did see a lot of things that I could done could have done better. And I wasn't relaxed enough, but when you're on that, um, you know, proverbial bubble that the UFC puts you on when you lose two fights in a row, you know, even if they they're not going to cut you or whatnot, you still feel it. And there's a sense of urgency where you know what you got to get it done. You got to find a way to get it done. You don't want to go out there and take too many risks, you know. And especially with somebody like Dan Henderson, who can put you out with with, with either hand and the power that he has, you got you got to be kind of careful. So. I wish I would have took a little bit more risk in that fight, but at the same time, uh, I was very happy with the way I performed. Was there something like exhausting about that fight? Because you did look tired in the third round. Is that what you're talking about, digging deep? Yeah, it, it was exhausting because you know when you when you're chucking those punches as hard as you can and you're ducking those punches and you got to grapple and you got to grab and all those things like that, it does take a little bit out of you. What can you say about about Vitor just briefly? It's not you. It's not every day that we see a guy, and not to say that he's completely changed his style, but he's evolved kind of, you know, it yeah. seems like a lot of guys, once they get to a certain age, they're, they're sort of the same guy and they just get in shape, and they, but they look the same, you know? I mean, why has Vitor came out and looked just so much different? The thing that I can say that, that Vitor has done more than anything um, is that he discovered himself, you know, and he's 100% confident and comfortable in his own skin, and that's something that, you know, he may have been fighting with before, and it may have been leading to the fact that he would get this performance and anxiety issues before he compete, you know. Uh, but now he has just a, a piece about himself and a, and a piece about competing. You know, and it reminds me of the, the thing that Randy Couture told me uh, when I was going to fight Chuck. And it was just make friends the worst outcome. And it seems to me that um, Vitor has made friends with the worst outcome. There's not an outcome that can happen in the fight that he can't live with. You know, he knows that no matter what happens, he's going to be okay. And once you compete like that, it makes you go out there and actually try things, you know, just just be free. You know what I'm saying? As you see those guys like John Jones and Anderson Silva and those guys who go out there and just, you know, they seem like they're just in, in their own zone. And it's because they're out there free. You know what I'm saying? They're not really worried because they, they're ultimately confident in their skill and their technique. Uh, at times I have. At times I have. I, I can't say I consistently found uh, that niche yet, but uh, but I'm working on it. For you, when you talked about you know stress of being on the bubble, once you come off of that win, is it a lot easier for you to go to training camp without that stress? Because it seems like it's a lot more mental for you. It is a lot easier to go when you're not on a bubble anymore because you, you just kind of can get back to fighting the way you way you can fight. You know what I'm saying? You know that um, you know because. You try not to, to think about it. You try not to be like, you know, I've lost two fights in a row. But what happens is people start coming up to you, talking to you like it. People treat you that kind of way. So before long, it does seep into your mind. It gets in your head. And pretty soon, you're, you're, the, the voice in your head starts to become the voices of other people saying things to you. Man, you think you still got it? Man, you think you washed up? Man, you think, and then that becomes that voice. And then you got to kind of rewrite that voice and try to teach it to say some positive things, but that could be the difficult part. So when you don't have to worry and hear that the whole time, you only got the good voice in the talking to you.